Hi, everyone. Um, it's a bit weird talking to the screen. Um, so I'm Tara Fraser. Uh, I'm director of the Collective. You probably met Beth a lot more than me. Uh, I'm one of the background, just get on with jobs. And what I've noticed is with a lot of projects is the relationship with the client and the engineer is, is really fundamental for how successful a project is perceived, in particular on self-build. And I'll talk about what that means in terms of self-build, low energy. And I'm kind of going to go through, hold on, let's see if we can do this. So yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about the practice, a little bit of background. We're talking about materials. So as engineers, we, we think about materials, both the good and the bad ones, as, as perceptions are. Uh, going to talk about typical clients, typical process. Going to talk about builders, because actually they're really important for self-build and the challenges that come with builders. Um, typical challenge and actually just recognize we don't always do the right thing you know I think it's important to actually recognize that you know we don't always get things right as engineers or as any part of the team but what we need to learn to do is how we get around that and how we change things yeah and learn from it so a little bit about build collective small practice we do structural engineering civil engineering so we got highways and drainage for that early input we're 14 years of the business most of our clients are private clients, so it's mostly private individuals that are looking to do their their own self-build, refurb, et cetera, and so forth. Yeah, so that's who we are. Uh, just some images of some of the projects. A lot of timber, but we're not exclusive to timber. Yeah, we can work in other materials. So materials. So what we find is a lot of people come to us at a, with anticipation of doing timber project. Yeah. And what we're learning is that actually it's really important to reach out and understand the availability of builders around you. So what we've also learned to do is we're starting to learn that actually sometimes we got, we use masonry. So we've done it in clay block, a done concrete, traditional block, thermite block, and large form clay block and that's that's been because we can't get a timber frame locally for a project and actually been quite successful um timber frame i think most people are familiar with timber frame so we've got stick build a uh, either be engineered timber softwood timber uh, we do sips we've done a few sips panel projects where clients have insisted upon it and then you got a uh, panel solid panels we don't like them because there's just too much timber in them, but we will do them. A concrete is used in ICF. They was wood fiber, but I believe wood fiber is no longer available in, in cellular blocks are no longer available in the UK at the moment. The supply went bankrupt. Uh, and and then the system builds and steel still goes into our buildings. We just have to be really careful where we put it. And we don't always get that right either, but we try. So masonry, we can, I, I would let's really emphasize this, we can deliver low energy buildings. We just got to be really careful about how we deal with wall ties, how we deal with lintels, and how we deal with interfaces. Yeah, so roof, roof to wall interfaces, floor interfaces, and then foundations. And that's where the self-builders, they're taking on a lot of responsibility around projects. And it's given them emphasis about those details and what they should expect to see on site because they won't be they don't often pay for architects and engineers to be on site and and monitor projects to the degree they need to be so it's about conveying the importance of what's on the drawing getting built on site on one project the client agreed to pay for us to come a once a month it was late afternoon they agreed to pay me in an hour of my time and actually take us to the pub afterwards and it was like just a process of his first experience working closer with the client this was actually a timber frame that went to masonry the reason for that was the local builders were all brickies and the timber frame manufacturers none of them were local and they didn't feel that was right for them and so it, on that project, it was like, we saw the foundations, we saw the floor slab, we saw the walls, we saw each key item, and we talked through what the challenges were on each of those elements. Particularly is, in that case, they went, they tried to design passive, and then they pulled back slightly to the point where they could afford the project. 
Oh, the other thing to do is movement joints. Yeah, movement joints are really important in our buildings. And we often forget about in terms of they're not shown in architects' drawings, but we need to think about what the movement joint is from a corner in clay brick, concrete, or if it's the large format, you've got 20 meters in a run or 10 meters from a corner. So it really is depending on what product is and just really appreciating that as well. All right, all right. But, but on, going on that, I mean, that's an awful lot of detail for a self-builder to take in right at the start. I mean, there was, there was we, a whole host of things there. Yeah, but it's it's very much, it's on the drawings and then it's also talking them through the process. And what we've done is we've kind of said, go to the self-build centre in East Swindon and put yourself on a few of the courses. And it's like the project management course and all the rest of it and get yourself an understanding of what you can do can do how you manage money how you manage each subcontractor and it depends I and mean, i'll talk about it later depends how involved that self-builder is going to get mm -hmm. yeah and the one i'm thinking about uh, he was on site every day he basically put up they put up a timber shed and he was on site looking at the drawings and he worked with what well, in his case we gave him a list of all the different contractors we would like you would want to use in your own project as an engineer Mm -hmm. so the drainage guy we recommended the foundation guy he found the brickies himself he found the joiners himself the mvhr we recommended a supplier for that and they went with them you know and each of those each time one of those new persons turned up on site we had a conversation what the expectations were so with the mason we said we don't expect snots in the cavity yeah and we expect the wall ties to be clean and all the rest of it. We, we want this inside to look as good as the outside. Quite literally, the first team, he, he, he sent away after two days and he started to find someone that was willing to do that. Yeah. Okay. So it is given that, and also give them the confidence. And that's what it is, about right? giving them the confidence to say, yeah, that's not right. Yeah. That's and bad. also... It, it's a house they're going to live in. It's not like something they're buying and they don't know what's going into it. Everything that they're going to make a decision on is going to influence the end product they're going to live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as for selection materials and that, once that's made, all that information is then condensed down, hopefully to manageable size. Yeah. Uh, then we go to timber. Best is mostly t uh, exclusively timber. We do timber stick build for small scale. Now, this depends on where your insulation is going and what type of insulation you're going to go for between the stick and then beyond on the outside of the render, what finishes you're going to go for, frame structure, whether it's going to be a panelized system, who the frame supplier is going to be. So in some instances, we start off in a project and then it's been taken over by a subcontractor. Yeah, who's going to design that whole timber package and we just end up with foundation package and insulation. In some instances, we work with the supplier and do the design for them. It just depends who that is. Yeah. And each one comes with a different price tag. Yeah. But you do get what you pay for. Yeah. A panel systems, SIPs. Um, we found that the SIPs suppliers, they provide the panels, but they don't do, not all of them do design. So we've done design packages for that. It's just a bit more convoluted for us because we've got to consider tolerances on each panel and specify each panel. So it's almost like a fabrication set of drawings we end up producing for that. Okay. CLT. Everyone that's been a CLT project for us so far has gone to a panelized system or a frame system. Yeah. Just because it's great for big scale projects or really square projects. But as soon as you add any interest in the architecture, it starts getting more complicated in terms of cost as well. And not all clients want to see a CLT finish on the inside of the building. No. Yeah. The thing with timber is we got to consider about its fire and vertical continuity. Okay. Different types of engineering products that we all know about, LVL, LSD, I-beams, glue beams, and cross lamp. And we do a lot of I-beams and a lot of LVL in our, in our packages and software. Okay. And once again, if it's a self-builder, they might be interested in who that, pro who that product's going to come from and how they're going to get access to that product. So an I-beam, for example, could be a cycle product but they might go to James Jones option or they might go somewhere else. So those those choices may, are made, if they're made earlier because of a cost, may have an impact on the design process. Now, the earlier those decisions are made, the better. And that's where self-builders 
can kind of look at the pennies if they're if they're really that way involved. Yeah. The problem arises when they're not that involved and they're going to push it to a builder and then the changes come right to the end. And that's that's a more problematic process for us. Concrete. I know we don't want to use concrete. I know we, it's 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 got it's the evil of everything we do at the moment, but there are places for it. Okay, it still belongs in foundations. Not all foundations, but it's still there. Depends on your ground conditions. Basement structures, you can't avoid concrete in a basement. Yeah, it is the product to use. Okay, ground floors can be the solution. It depends how we're doing. And then underpinning, if it's retrofit, it'll often appear in those sort of thing. There are alternatives, but largely it's low technology, easily accessible, and clients understand it and builders understand it. Yeah. And uh, I just got Pico down on the bottom just to show how you can kind of minimize, manage to minimize the volumetric of concrete in a even a strip foundation. In that case, that was a piled system with ground beams because the ground was so poor. Yeah, so we didn't have a choice of doing anything else. The raft would have been a problem because the soil would have been potentially damaged with the river close by. Steel, once again, perceived as evil, but right place. And architects like big spans, they like big opening windows. Clients like lovely big open windows. And so steel still belongs in that situation. We can control deflections easier. Yeah, and we can take up less space with the steel. The problem is we have to think about where it's going to sit within the envelope of the building. Yeah, it's okay internally on the outside elevation. We've got to really think about where that is. Okay. What we've noticed is some suppliers that do timber frame, they won't talk about what steel they're going to put in. You've bought the product and then the steel appears. And there's no, there's no option about it afterwards. The client's paid for that product and they get what they get. And we see that quite a lot as well. Okay. Yeah. Steel, fire. Yeah, that's the one thing. Got to think about fire and intubescent paints and all the rest of it, either we're going to expose it or whether we're going to cover it over. Next, clients. Okay, new build client. Our new build client, and I'll talk about our clients now, are generally low energy timber frame. That's where most of our projects kind of start from. That's where their aspirations are. Refurb usually simpler, usually they're looking for energy reduction. It's more complicated because we've got existing structure to work around, okay? And we get two different levels. We get the one that's involved in every detail, and then we've got the one that kind of sits in the background in the sofa and pays the bills and talks to the architect, and we never get to meet them. I think that we end up with a poor result as engineers on that result because we don't buy into that quite easily. You know, it's good to actually meet a human being and understand their aspirations. And if we don't have that, it's a piece of paper. You know, it's really important that we get to meet the, the client and, and have that conversation. We build a relationship. We're more likely to do things a bit more, go a bit beyond the the boundaries because we know that human being. It's just human nature. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because we were, we were talking about that before, before we started the call. It'd be interesting to hear from any architects on the on the call what they think about in terms of do they prefer to protect their clients and and um, keep them isolated or, or or whether they see the value in having consultants um have joining that conversation so if, yeah if anyone wants to say anything there that'd be great but um i'm with you on that one tyler okay i've got one board done <laughs> <laughs> successful projects so the successful client has to have a real understanding of the three elements, program, cost, and quality. Yeah, because we all know if you want program and quality, your cost goes up. And and, and, and just there, I'm understanding what that is. They're going to they're gonna understand it. And I think the main one that usually gets pushed, they're cost-focused and they're quality-focused. Program becomes a problem when they get a main contractor on board and do the whole project. That can be a problem at that point in time. Yeah, a practical focus on low energy, I'd say it comes down to the two things, air tightness and insulation. If they're not done right, you haven't got a low energy building. Yeah, and really emphasizing that. So that client that was on site, I introduced them to tape and I said, you keep it on you all times. And every time you're in doubt, you think it's a gap, you stick a bit more tape on it. Yeah. 
and he went on the training course for the air tape and worked out how to use it. And actually, when he came to get his results, he got 0. 0.3. So, you know, he did his job. Yeah. And when he was worried about things, he wasn't sure about things, he'd pick the phone up or he WhatsApp a little image and kind of said, I think I've got a problem here. What do you think? Yeah. And we did a bit of conversation. And if there's a problem, you know, we catch up. And if not, we talk about it and sort it out. Okay. Clients material selection. It is all about how their aspiration is. Yeah. I don't deny it. Most of our clients are interested in how much or minimum damage to the environment. Yeah. They've got to that stage in their life where they want a minimum material. Their building is probably going, they're thinking about it as their end of life house as well. And, and that's, it's a house they're going to live in forever. So it's going to have to be adaptable as well. That's usually part of that process for us as well, making sure that potentially lift can get put in at a later date or things like that. Or they're going to move from a two story building into a ground floor structure and they can upstairs becomes more for other people in the future. So there's all that kind of, well, and, and it might affect the engineering as well. Yeah. What I would say about design time is the more conversation we have at the start, the four things are to a frozen, the better really, because we can make the best impact. Yeah. If it's all done and drawn up and plans are done, we struggle to make a huge impact because we're kind of left with what there's a frozen design in effect. So once again, with that client that we've got in mind, we got involved before they got planning. So we were able to have a conversation. And that particular one, it was uh, supposed to be retrofit. And we ended up doing a complete new build eventually on that job because actually it came in co most cost effective as well. And they got a really good quality engineer, low energy building. Yeah. And the other thing I would say with clients is they've got to be adaptable and accommodate change. Nothing is perfect in this world. Ch things go wrong on site. Yeah. People build things wrong. Things aren't always what we expect. So how do we get around it without blowing our top? And, you know, otherwise the design team run for the hills and no one's going to deal with the clients. Got You know, so actually it's about understanding that actually things happen on site. Um, Tara, just have a question about air tightness, actually. Yep. JRT, did you want to come off uh, mute and ask your question? Yeah, right. I hope I'm off you now. You are, you um, are. Right. Um, I think you just touched on the idea that um, foundations and particularly, uh, I didn't hear you mention basements, but I sort of read that into it, um, pretty much need concrete. But my, And you also were talking about taping uh, air barriers. So yeah. my question is, to what extent is um, cast concrete airtight itself and to what extent does it need um, something like membranes. If you've got basement structure, you're going to have a waterproofing system that probably is by default airtight. Okay. Yeah, and concrete is porous. It's not. It's not perfect product. Yeah. It it has got potential pathways in it. It's you know, it takes a long time. But there are different things in basement structures to kind of consider. So there is what gr what grade of basement you're looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so grade three, probably for a, a, a occupancy. If it's passive, you're going to have to consider where the insulation is going in. So you're probably going to be, build a basement, waterproofing, insulation, and then you're going to have another layer, probably you know, a tanking system, and then probably a wall. And then your house, your building's going to be sat within that. So that kind of there's quite a big build up generally in a basement. If you've got a tight site, if you've got space to go out, you then could put the insulation on the outside. It just depends. And it also depends on where your water table is relative to your site as well. And that's the yeah. key, really. So if you've got a high water table, you're going to have a buoyancy issue. We're going to have not, not as, well, as well keep the water out. We're going to have to keep the basement from coming popping up out of the ground. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing. Uh, and if you've got low water table, we've got, got less risk, but we still got to think about it because the one thing we don't want is water in a basement in a habitable space. Okay. Right. And, and the problem is, a insurance now. So my PIA insurance won't allow me to design the waterproofing system in a basement. And most of the architects I meet, and maybe someone can a, a, confirm this, most architects don't have waterproof basement insurance. So you have to go to specialists now for your waterproofing system. Yeah, I mean, all that you said there <laughs> kind of chimes in with the people who told me, don't do a basement. <laughs> 
I think it's doing it right. It's finding the right builder and the right contractor that understands what they do. So we're doing one in London and actually it's taken six months for the architect and ourselves to find someone we feel comfortable with to work with a client to get their basement in that project. Yeah. Yeah. Be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Right, so next one, um, yeah, so successful project, early discussions, pre-planning, you know, and understanding low-cost discussion. They're low-cost discussions. They don't cost a huge amount of money to start the conversations at that point. Yeah, we haven't put numbers in. We're not spending time doing analysis or anything else. We're just having conversations, yeah? And that might be half an hour in a meeting, an hour or whatever. It just really helps reduce change later on yeah and are those com those conversations they come via the architect or or is the client reaching out to you before they've even spoken to an architect um so if they reach out to us first we will then say you need an architect yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but you know because we, we recognize we've got our skill sets and architects got their skill sets and actually what we kind of say is look here's people that we work with go and have a chat see who you like to work with what we often see is working with an architect is like a marriage you're going to feel like you want to divorce them occasionally, but actually you've got to work through the pain as well as, you know, and it's the same with us as engineers. It's like, you know, but we're not quite so intimate with a client, if you like. We don't, we spend less time with that process because I think on average, our understanding, we're doing four to five times the number of projects an architect would, our architectural practice would do, really. Yeah. So, yeah. So, on the one we did, the client and the architect actually said, you need to get an engineer on board early. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what happened, you know, and that if that happens, it's really good, really. Yeah, it doesn't have to cost a fortune. Yeah, consider materials. So that's considering local trades and how you want to work with your project. Yeah, so we've had, had a job done in Somerset where the, we started off timber frame and we had jumbo clay blocks. A, the one that's local was a thermite internal block, dense block outside with a good cavity size and good insulation and good wall tide control and all the rest of it. Okay, so it's just understanding that right from the start. And some clients will come say, I'm only going to do timber, and that's fine. Yeah, but if we're doing that, we need to understand what suppliers you're going to go to because different suppliers are going to have different details and different levels of input to that process. Yeah, it might mean we step back and only do certain things. It just depends on who that is. Okay. The other thing we've worked out is actually when you're doing a self-build, you're part of the community you're around. Okay. And it, it was really interesting when we had a client that moved into an area. It was they were seen as horrible people that were coming into the local community. But by building the house with local people, and interacting with people. So for example, they had timber beams to lift and they were like going, oh, I'm gonna have got a crane, it's gonna be a thousand pounds. I said, go into the pub and find the local farmer, find out who's got a telehandler, yeah? And get him to give you a hand. And so, you know, the farmer, because it was off season, he was happy to get chucked, chucked money and some drinks in the pub and, you know, and it got him that integration, yeah? Some of the details was you could get products sent halfway around the country but actually local backsmith did some of the details you know it's just building that relationship so now you know they're really well known respected in the community everyone who loves the house as well because it's part of the community yeah and the other thing is you're going to fall out and this is, this is really important you're not going we're not going to agree about everything we're going to have disagreements it's not always going to end yeah and understand limitations and understand tolerances and if we get that right we can you know we can disagree without actually sulking and disappearing into our corners. We need to be adults about this. Yeah. Process. Process. So we like to have fun. I know we're engineers. I know we've got bad rep. Yeah. But actually, we like to have a bit of fun. We like to enjoy what we're doing. Yeah. And we like a little challenge. We like the challenges as well. Yeah. We like to be done in a timely manner as well. We really enjoy it when we get to know our clients. So when we're held away from a client, we have got no buy-in. We're human beings. We'd get no buy-in. If we're doing that, we're just doing numbers. We're just a computer then, in effect. Yeah? And when are we going to, you know, how do we communicate what we want to do? Yeah? And how we can improve things. If we're only being treated like that, we're going to do what we get. You know, you reciprocate what you get. Yeah? 
we want to get to know the architect, yeah? And we get different response. You know, some architects we go on lovely with, and some, once again, we treat like a computer, you know? It, it, but you get what you, how you interact with us, you know? Uh, another thing to remember is we interface with a lot of trades, yeah? So actually... It's like if our clients are asking for people, we can probably give them a list of people. And because we've probably seen their work, we can, you know, we won't recommend someone we've seen bad work from. You know, it's it's a really hard push for us to sometimes recommend because it's like, well, it'll come back on us. You know what I mean? So, you know, joiners, timber framers, eh, Rickies, ground workers, ground workers, got some lovely ground workers in Bristol. You know, but it's like once you find them, you want to make sure they're the ones that are working on your job because actually they do a good job. They're careful and considerate. I've had a job just recently where the foundations have been out by plus or minus 85 mil. And that is not within tolerance. Yeah. A client chose the ground worker and that's what they got. Yeah. And that's just unacceptable. Yeah. On the ones we work on, they do a, re you know, they do a really tidy job. And actually a client was on one of them I was really happy with the tidiness of the client you know they tidied up after themselves took everything away and everything they're really happy okay so trades just remember and architects got you know architects are the same they'll have a load of people they want to work with as well a common issue is late changes they just cause delay yeah so just to, just to re re we're an engineering business we program the time to do our job it changes if they happen after we've done it they've got to fit around the jobs we're now working on and it just takes time and effort. And, and that's where the, I think that's where the frustration gets. Yeah. Cause we're not work. you know, we work a quite sharp, sharp, short periods of time. We work on jobs generally. Yeah. And when we may have 20 to 40 jobs going on in one time, different stages, but we kind of, you know, if you want to change something after key points, it just takes a bit of time. And usually if the contractors on board, it just gets really complicated. Yeah, so that's why that early communication, early ideas, and all that stuff really help. Contract changes. Where do we start? I guess this is this is this is really interesting for us because what we find is that in some situations where we've given the team clients and they all understand it goes on well, on other situations the builder comes involved after with a set of drawings and they get on with it and then they want to change everything because they're looking at the commercial aspect of the build for themselves and they want to change various things to make more profit and they're not going to change for any other reason other than either to make more profit yeah because they've been given a set of drawings they should be able to build from them and they sh that should be what they're, they're priced on yeah so we get a lot of build and the other thing we find is in our industry, we get a lot of builders that, that use set suppliers. And actually, they won't go beyond that sometimes. So it's it's quite an interesting challenge. Yeah. A late M&E input. So we love to get our M&E early, particularly for passive, because we want to see where MBHR is and all the rest of it. We really hate having to sort out holes after the fact, because actually, generally, we've designed everything to the lowest depth. And all of a sudden, we're trying to stick a whacking big hole through it. Not great. If you're doing that, Go for a positive joist solution. Then at least you got the routing through the floor. Um, more recent things. A uh, bill and cruel changed in 2013. They can now only approve designs. They cannot change them. They cannot make comments. They cannot provide advice. All they can do is approve what's been provided. They can challenge the engineer or the architect, whoever else's product is they. We do not believe it complies to building regulations. That's all they can do. So that is a definite change. Yeah. That's going to impact on the self-builder. So the self-builder traditionally has gone and talked to a lot to building control and get a lot of advice, but they're not allowed to do that anymore. Okay. The other thing that gets forgotten about is warranty supplier. Yeah. Who the warranty supplier is going to be. Are they having a warranty supplier and how that's going to affect the choice of materials? and some of the details in the build. Yeah, so if you, if you think about warranty, you want to get that. That's one of those early thinking pro points. Okay. Finance, mortgages, cash flow. Um, so it's really thinking about, clients think about how they're going to spend the money because there'll be key stages at which they can 
get change what they're spending into a mortgage yeah and really understand what that and that might change the way you do a build yeah you might want to change how you do a building on that situation i've yet to meet a project that doesn't have overspend yeah well and also the other thing is realistic budgets please yeah it's like i hear the word value engineer once more i'm going to scream it's not value engineering, it's cost cutting. The only way you can cost cut is by reducing specification or reducing area. Yeah, there is a consequence to cost cutting. Yeah, QSs, we see them very infrequently on projects. Yeah, but they do help occasionally. Yeah, I think they really do. And then the other thing is, and it was during, a, there was a real lot of inflation on materials and availability after the pandemic. It's calmed down now, but it was just a classic example on one project. The, the building was built, but they just waited on the cladding until the cladding price came back down. So they, they waited about a year and a half, and now it's come back down to a price that they can actually tolerate again, so they're finishing off. And the other thing is tax reclaim. Clients need a bit of advice on tax reclaiming on a new build to make sure they can get that to VAT back. Yeah, there's, it's quite stringent on what they can and can't do on that set. Yeah, and there's some specialists out there to help. Health and safety. Our clients are agnostic when it comes to this. And actually, it's really, you know, we can't expect them to understand what they're going to do. But once again, we kind of say, you can, if you go to the, you know, do a bit of research, find out what you're doing, tidy site, safe site, working in height, and get them to kind of go through the health and safety website and get themselves a bit more aware of that particularly in the self builders that are going to compartmentalize packages yeah so they might have a ground worker bricky joiner and it's just making themselves aware that they've got responsibility for that safety um tara just before you go oh. on yep. chris, has, chris has asked a question about suppliers um doesn't have a mic um so he, he's asking um do you have any recommendations for good m e design consultants um, uh, Chris, I know you're you're based in. I think I'm right. You're based in the Godalming area. I mean, obviously there's mesh energy you can get in touch with, but um, <laughs> in terms of um, you know other other people in in Tower, do you do, do you have a list of sort of M and E design consultants? Uh, so most of the most of the suppliers will do a design for for a MBHR. It does have a, usually a a number associated with it. Yeah. And I think there's four that we see regularly. Yeah. I can probably go and rake them out. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I think, Chris, you can, um, I'll share Tara's details afterwards, actually, if, you, if that's okay. And do it that way. Yeah. So what I would say about MB, uh, MBHR is you get three different types. So you've got flexi duct, semi rigid, and rigid. They all have consequences to program and they have all consequences to sequence of works. Mm. Just don't like the uh, flexi ducts. Yeah, but the semi rigids work really successfully, and the rigid you have to think about putting them in while you put your floor in because they only want you, you. They don't. They're not not very manipulative. Easy to install. Yeah. Oh, did I go back? Oh, how do I go back? How do I go back? Did I just skip on one? Um, you have, but I don't know where your left button would be. Yeah, was that? Or you skipped on the couple. Was that one? Yeah, fine. I think it's something. Yeah, the good builders, the good, bad, and brilliant. I was going to good, bad, and ugly, but I thought well, actually, you know, some of them are actually really good. So I'm not, you know, and actually, you know, most people care about what they do for a living. Okay, so with clients, it's it's nice when they talk about costs, whether they they understand how the builders come about the number. Now, some builders just won't do anything more than price per square meter. Some will do breakdown. Yeah, we're we're working at a different part of the industry. This is not big projects where everything's breaking down by QS, but it's really helpful. Yeah, and understand cash flow. Cash flow is absolutely key on this. Yeah, consider how your materials are going to get purchased. So, is the builder going to purchase it, or in our situation, a lot of clients will purchase the materials direct, and they learn how to haggle and they learn how to communicate with different suppliers, and to get the best value for money. Yeah, and I think in the clients, you know, I know it's a lot of time. I know it's a lot of effort in a client situation. It won't work for everyone, but actually, 
you'll understand what you're getting for your money then. Yeah. And what happens then, the builders on a day rate to do building work. So you've got to make sure that they're doing their job as well. But it works out quite well, I think, in that situation, as long as you've got the understanding what you're doing. You know, are you going to break it down? Are you going to have a groundworker? Are you going to have a framer, mason, joiner, briefer, plumber, electrician, decorator? You know, are you going to break it down into compartments or are you just going to get the big builder to do all that and have his markup? You know, the, in a bit, builders, quite rightly, if he's doing all that, he's going to put a markup on each of those trays. Yeah, and all the materials. So there's a saving to be had for a self builder. And I think as a self builder, you need all the help you can get when it comes to, to you know, making sure it's affordable. You know, the builder you got to remember is he'll have a specific, he'll have come from a specific trade and it's understand what specific trade he comes from. I've met builders that, are, you know, the guy might be, have been a plumber or an electrician. Groundworker. So they'll have their different nuances that they're particularly good at. Okay. Uh, and also thing to understand is the insurance limitations of the builder. The builder has got no design insurance cover. Yeah. So anything he changes, he's making a suggestion, but he's not got any design responsibility for that. Or he doesn't have any insurance to cover himself against that. He's just got his general builder's insurance. Change in possible. Um, right, builders are human beings, okay? And that's the thing to remember. We're all human beings in this world. Yeah, we're trying to get through. We've all got to make a profit. We've all got to live a, live a life, and it's really appreciating that as well. So what I learned, let me learn is that builders, they can't, they, there's a perception they're stuck in their ways, okay? When you're doing low, low energy, passive standard houses, you've got your, Specialists, and there are quite a lot of specialists out there. Uh, I quite enjoy it when the builders come in on board with a kind of like, I haven't done this before, but I'm quite interested. Yeah. And it's about then walking with them through the project. Yeah. And making them understand what you're trying to do. Yeah. And why we do things this way. Yeah. So, you know, we've had this a few times. Yeah. And it's just taking time to explain to them and understand their willingness to adapt, yeah? And that might be as simple as parge coating. It might be as simple as using engineered timber joists, A connectors, or things like that. It's just about learning new different, new de new techno technology, you know? That one a, where the client was managing it, the builder, we introduced him to Rothabas connections on timber. He was cursing and swearing, but actually when he got found out, he could just lift it up, drop it in, and clip it in, and then two screws in. He didn't have to spend a lot of time up the ladder. It's so much safer. And now he does it in all his projects. You know? And so and then the parge coat in, he's understand what a parge coat, and he's like going, I'll do that on one moment, you know. And it's just learning new technology and actually adapting it to the next project. Yeah, and understanding the consequence of that change. Yeah. The other thing is. Most of our buildings end up with underfloor heating. Talking to our clients, most of them never turn the heating on. Yeah, might it's just it's just a really interesting thing when our buildings. It's like because of passive floor, it's like they're very rarely turn the flooring on. Yeah, it's in there, but hardly ever used. Yeah, and that, just remember, there are some really amazing builders out there. Yeah, that are happy to listen and adapt. Low energy does not mean passive house. And I think that's, in our case, a lot of clients come with a passive house idea and they end up with low low energy. So they end up just falling short. That might be because they don't want to pay for the passive house certification. It might be they can't quite afford the push in terms of installation values, new values, but they, they, they kind of get as close as they can. So they'll still keep to the air tightness. So they're going to stick to get as low as they can on the air tightness. Yeah, that, you know, and they're going to try and do the U value that's the best cost optimization for them at that point in time. Okay. Oh, just before you go on from um, that last slide, Tara, Chris has asked a question about parge coating. And if you just could expand upon it, please. All oh, right. Parge coating is uh, so on masonry structures where you've got the inconsistency on the surface or the joints, a parge coating is like a slurry 
product you mix up and then you brush apply it to all the wall and over everything on the wall and the importance there is then when you fix back through you make sure you tape up anything you've picked put, push back through that wall as well yeah but it's a basically it's a product you buy it's still breathable but it it just you know in terms of moisture pathway but not in terms of air yeah in the case quite literally bucket you mix it up bucket brush and you just brush it everywhere you can put a, i've seen it put on a bit too thick where it starts to crack but that's that's been an interesting challenge yeah so that is does that, does that make it clear yeah chris doesn't have a mic but i'm sure that does thank you right, successful point best laid plans not everything goes to plan things go wrong Foundations are the biggest risk on a project because the ground conditions, we never show exactly what, you know, we get a site investigation. It might change when we get, so you might hit a well or whatever. Ground is unknown. You can't dig your hole where all your foundations are when you start. So they're always going to be the highest risk element on a project in my head. Yeah. Clients don't like paying for site investigation. Yeah. But it mitigates that risk. Yeah. And it gets more complex when you're on sloping sites or complex geology. So if you're in the Cotswolds, you know, there's some complex geology out there, slope stability and all the rest of it. So what I will say is if a site's empty, it might be empty for a reason. Yeah. Particularly, so for example, in Bath, there are sites all over it that people wonder if they're, they've got slope instability. In one job, we had retaining walls and it worked out the walls were just stable in dry conditions when the rain was in it the walls were unstable so we had to you know that's kind of where you're at yeah I, I remember um beth talking about the requirement for a site investigation when she was on previously she said you know you're just not worth the risk not to have one yeah 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 even it's just like start with geology maps and then dig a trap it you know yeah. it just starts you starts the thing you know it, it depends on the site. It's all site specific, but it is not worth the, the cost saving. Yeah. Because that's where the money will run away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, Penny may mean concrete. It may not always, it may not be a screw pile timber floor. It may be a concrete raft. You know, it could be strip foundations. It just depends what the ground's doing. Okay. So you work with the site. We don't try and battle against it. We try and work with what we've got in that site, yeah? Because there are the fill materials. So any material you're importing, you can, most products you bring on site can all be from a recycled product, yeah? Of some form. Just make sure it's specified correctly, okay? Concrete, no. Don't, don't, don't put recycled product in concrete, no. Bad idea. <laughs> yeah. And there's no such thing as green concrete. I see it advertised, but yeah, it's just it's just a marketing wash in my head when you look at that, look through the detail. A site tolerances, what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. So for example, in groundwork, you're allowed plus or minus 25 mil on a deviation on any material you could put on a level. Yeah, that's why they put a little lining layer on to get the tolerances down and then the slab you allowed, what is the tolerances on that? You're not allowed to accumulate them, but if you got to understand what those deviations are, you know, a room can be out plus or minus 10 mil, uh, you know, a wall deviation. They're all, there's all tolerances in there. They're not allowed to accumulate, but they're part of that process. And so it's just understanding what those are. Yeah. And material availability. Yeah. Okay. So because of new building regulations, when we're specifying a product, if that product changes, someone's got to go back through and justify that new product. So that could be the supplier. The supplier could come along and say, that's equivalent to that. Then they take that responsibility, but it's really understanding. So I think classic one is lintels. Lintels, screws, joist hangers, they're all proprietary products. Okay. And it's about understanding whose products you're going to be using. Because once you've done the design, it takes time to go back through and use another product that might be out there. Yeah. And redesign connections or wherever it might be. Yeah. Clients don't like paying twice. And that is it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, oh, wow. that's, that's longer than I expected. <laughs> no, no, but it was good. It was, well, it's nice to have the, the questions in, in, um, whilst we're going through. It was also, I mean, it's just a, 
extremely comprehensive run through of um, all the things that we need to consider um, as a self builder. And um, yeah, I like this. I like um, so the way the way you sort of work with the clients by the by the sounds of it. You know, just being able to get hold of you, um, message you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, again before the call, we were stating out. You know. It's very easy just to keep things completely um, regimented and have kind of contractual problems. But, you know, it sounds like it's quite a good uh, working relationship that you have with your clients, you know, and that, and that includes trying. about humans a lot. So it, it's, it's clearly that's clearly important. I think I think that's changed with me because, I, you know, I trained to become a therapist and actually it worked out that we're all human. You know, mm -hmm. we're not we're not just machines. We're not just people that's going to pay us money. We need to actually motivation is about our humanity in some ways and actually it's really important yeah yeah, yeah. you know because work i know we get paid for work but actually it's just good to be able to kind of like meet a human being and agree things mm -hmm. yeah pick up the phone have a conversation or whatever it is yeah um oh, there you go. yeah <laughs> Yeah, ART says so sounds like Tara's identified a need for client educational courses. Um, yeah, I I think with clients, it's like, yeah, but the clients should be able to be taught told how to work with the team. I don't think I think the team should be able to give them a lot of that and then point them in direction to fill the gaps, if you like. I think there's just got I think clients got to recognise that architects have gone and studied and they do what they do for a long period of time to become what competent in what they do engineers take a long time to go and do what they learn to do to, you know competent to do what they do yeah and actually the other challenge is that you go to 20 engineers you get 20 different solutions you go to 20 architects you get 20 different solutions it doesn't mean there's a right or wrong it's just that we all have different opinions and we've got different mm -hmm. ways of working yeah indeed indeed well, that's been fabulous. Thank you very much. If if there's aren't any more questions, then um, you know we'll wrap it wrap it up here. But no, it's very very, very good session. Thank you, Tara. Um, that's right. Glad we could uh, rely on Bill Collective once again to um, inform inform Meshworks, and I'm much, much appreciated. Right. So, no problem. last calls for questions. No, right. I'll um, say goodbye then Tara Thank, thanks a lot so yeah I'll, I'll record this and I'll, I'll share it with you as well so um, um, yeah thanks for your time thank you cheers then thanks guys bye bye